Well, my contribution is dealing with the approach to assessment of existing structures. And when we speak about existing structures, we have various ideas in our mind. So we can have uh, uh, damaged structures, but uh, oh, damaged structures, but we can also have undamaged structures. And uh, the undamaged structure is also very often uh, required to be assessed because there are other influences, uh, like other loads. Well, Okay. Well, a general representation of the whole process is is this. You certainly have uh, seen. Okay. Oh. No. Yes. You certainly have seen sometimes this diagram where we represent the resistance of a structure. And this resistance of a structure is due to aging, reducing in time. On the other hand, we have the traffic or the load, and the load very often increases in time. And this type of pictures, we are not shocked to see this because it's every day's uh, reality. And here you see also very large trucks with heavy loads. And uh, this see, becomes a problem in time huh, because the resistance is decreasing and the, tr the traffic load is increasing. And at a certain moment, we have um, structural safety, which is not acceptable anymore. Well, this is a simplified representation because um, we have already discussed that some structures have a residual capacity. Huh? Uh, Johan Silverbrand just said, uh, uh, he complained a little bit about that the structure is always a little bit more, more heavy, but more material. But we can take profit of this a lot. And in the past, we have also had these structures. And very often, we do not need strengthening huh? because there is implicit reserve capacity. And this is a very important thing because we can mobilize this if we have more accurate uh, methods of determination. Huh? But we can also be unlucky, and we can have structures which are 60 years old and which have been designed according to codes which are not accepted anymore. So we can have non-compliant details, and then it goes down. And these effects have to be regarded when we uh, carry out an assessment. Oh. <laughs> Well, let's have a look. We have determination of bearing capacity as accurately as possible. That's what I said already. And we have to cope with the influence of deterioration in time. And we have to cope with the effect of non-compliant details. And if we, I start with this one, uh, the use of level of approximation has been introduced in the model code 2010. That means do not make the assessment with design rules, but do it with more advanced rules, because this uh, residual capacity can be mobilized in this way. Uh, one example of a level of approximation is, uh, for, um, is, is here. It is described in chapter 28. You can, for instance, choose um, an informal quality, qualitative assessment, measurement-based determination of load effects, Partial factor method based on document review and re visual inspection. Partial factor method based on supplementary investigation. Modified target reliability modification of partial factors. It, it's too short time to explain that all. Or the last one, the full probabilistic assessment. And the idea is, if you need uh, to take profit of the residual capacity, then you take more and more advanced uh, structures. But um, this is basically a good idea for new structures, but as soon as you have damaged structures, then it is a little bit more tricky because the input values of your parameters may be less well uh, certain. Huh? Because if you have cracks due to deterioration, then you have to assess the bond, for instance. But we are not so sure about it. We cannot always measure it. Huh? So therefore, we have to 
input of more conservative values, and then it might be that the highest level of approximation is not the best one. Huh? So this, these type of things we have always to consider when we are dealing with existing structures. Well, um, we have a number of chapters, and on concrete, but also on deteriorating concrete, transport of liquids, properties, uh, defining durability, and so on. And let's have a look here. This is, for instance, uh, an example of alkali silica reaction. And here we see this, this, uh, this picture. And uh, one of my colleagues, Professor Piotr Nowakowski, he is a specialist in cracking. He has once made a statement and said, well, cracking is the language of a concrete structure. It tells you about its condition. And then it is um, not so easy because here we have some um, uh, parameters uh, in time developing for different types of concrete suffering alkali silica reaction. And you see very large differences. Uh, and also here we see the modulus of elasticity goes going down with very big differences. And that means that we cannot use existing formulations. I just put some factor for alkali silica reaction, but we have to be much more critical. And also here, we see that if you have alkali silica reaction, we have an expansion of the material. And if we have an expansion, and it is partially confined, you have a pre-cracked structure. And also that can have an influence. <coughs> Similar conditions apply to reinforcing steel. And uh, reinforcing steel, uh, we, have, we need stress rain relations, and uh, we have to cope with deterioration. And this is an interesting one because, oh, sorry, because this is a bar with pitting corrosion, and we see reduction everywhere. And this reduction is influencing, well, the axial capacity, tensile capacity, but it's also influencing the ultimate strain of the structure. Because if we have locally uh, yielding, uh, it can be compensated, this loss can be compensated by hardening. Huh? But if we have hardening, all the deformation concentrates in a number of pits. And this is a very interesting topic, and the last years uh, a lot of research has been carried out. This is, for instance, uh, the result of, of such a research. research. And uh, it turns out that there is one governing parameter, and that is the procentual loss of weight of such a bar. If you can take a number of samples, and you determine the weight, and you compare it with the, the virgin weight, then you can come to conclusions about the properties. Here we see that, for instance, this, these are the stress strain relations. This is an undamaged uh, bar. And as soon as you, if you have a loss of 10% weight, then you see the capacity is going down, but also the ultimate strain is going down. And here we have relations, for instance, a linear reduction for the ultimate strain or the ultimate uh, capacity. And here we have a more exponential type um, of reduction for the ultimate strain. And that is very important because ultimate strain is important because in nearly all our models, it is assumed that the yielding deformation of the steel is not a limit. And here, if we have substantial corrosion, the steel is more brittle. That means redistribution processes are not as generous as, as before. Well, we have, of course, the question how to assess structures with deterioration. And um, this has been coupled to the models which have been developed for uh, new structures uh, without deterioration. And initially the idea was maybe we can introduce some factors uh, representing the effect of corrosion to make life more easy. But it is not so simple as that. And therefore we have made uh, various chapters. For instance, for uh, structures with ASR, we cannot say here we have a factor, there we have a factor, there we have a constant. It does not work like that. We have visual inspection of the structures. We need expertise also to do that. So we have structures with ASR, structures with corroded reinforcement, structures damaged by freeze, thaw effects, structures subjected by sulfate attack. And there you can find indications of how to manage your individual case. 
Well, this is the most simple case. Uh, that is the determination of the bearing capacity of a structure. What happens when we have corrosion? Well, uh, at the bottom, of course, we have a reduction of the capacity uh, due to pitting or um, uh, general corrosion. And in the top, we have this also, but most probably the cover is pushed off. And due to cracking around these corroding bars, we can have a reduction of the ultimate capacity. And also, we can have, due to cracking around the bars, we can have a loss of bond, and we can have a loss of anchorage, and so on. All these things have to be regarded. And I said also that the ultimate strain of a corroded rebar is also very important in some cases. And uh, here we have, for instance, such an example. We have rotation capacity when we have statically undetermined systems. And in the model code 2010 and in the Eurocode, we have defined an area where we have a maximum allowable rotation. And this can be taken from this diagram. Here you have the ultimate rotation. And here you see the height, the x over d, the height of the compression area. And we see two sets of, of lines. The dotted line is class C ductility, with an ultimate strain of 7.5%. And this is a more moderate class with 5%, and we have these ones. So that means that if you have corroded uh, reinforcement, for instance, in a parking house, there is a, somewhere an, a, a moment, a bending moment there, chloride can pass through the cracks, and you have a reduction. That means you have a reduction of your rotation capacity, which has an immediate effect on your bearing capacity. So here you can find, uh, with your ultimate strain, you can find somewhere a, a line in between, or maybe we have to develop new lines. I said another aspect is non-compliant detailing. And this is a very important aspect because non-compliant detailing is detailing based on former codes. Many, many structures have been designed before the certain time models have been introduced, for instance. So you, can, you see variants of details which are out of time, but can also be dangerous. And uh, one example, which is known to many people, is the half joint in precast concrete. So we have a corbel here, a depth and beam. And uh, if we have cars on the deck and chlorides, the chlorides are going, going down here. And mostly we have here a re-entrant crack. And if you have this re-entrant crack, the chloride is going there and enters the crack. But then it meets immediately the suspension reinforcement, which is carrying the whole area of this beam. So this is a very dangerous situation. And also, um, it is very hard to, to inspect and to find. And in the UK, a large uh, research program has been carry carried out. Uh, it's a very interesting program. And they have invested hundreds of these details and found out that not only wrong details are there, but also uh, mistakes in, in, in placement and so on. So you have an overview, a very uh, interesting and instructing overview about this particular situation. Another non-compliant detail has to do with the profilation of the steel. We have now, nowadays we have red steel. Huh? Nobody thinks about de detailing something with, with smooth steel. But in the past, by definition, the steel was generally like that. And this has, of course, an effect of the bearing capacity, not only on the width of the cracks, but it can also influence the shear capacity. So we had a lot of discussion in this, and I have another short presentation this afternoon. I will come back on this. Another non-compliant detail, which is also very important, it will not influence immediately the structural safety, but on the long run it does, is the, the, the cover on the bars. And here I have a diagram of the Netherlands, and we see that 1920, the cover was in certain cases 10 millimeter, 15 millimeter. And then in the years, the consciousness came that this is not enough. So stepwise, the minimum cover has been increased until much larger values. But if we have to investigate the bridge of 16 year old, we investigate here, but the bridge has been somewhere, somewhere here. And that means that we have to really to to be very careful with the evaluation and uh, 
Karman has just already shown this equation uh, with the chloride concentration according to Fick's law. And uh, there is an apparent uh, diffusion coefficient. And people ask, what is apparent? Huh? Because we can uh, determine by a, a fast chloride penetration test. Huh? But then you have a theoretical value. And when you really want to use these formulations, you have to take the course from the structure itself. You find the chloride profile, and you can calculate back what is this, this value. But another thing is the cover itself, because the cover itself is not always according exactly to the, to the codes. Huh? And uh, we have also scattered there. So we can make an analysis uh, and calculate approximately the end of the initiation time. And then it was, is becoming more uh, difficult, as Carmen said already. And these type of... One minute? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is my last uh, picture. <coughs> and it has to do uh, also with determining the ultimate capacity, uh, the optimum use of nonlinear finite element methods for assessment. And I tell you a sh short story um, with discussion from the past. Uh, we were once in the 80s in the Netherlands. We had a conference, and there Michael Collins from... Uh, from Canada, he said, all these calculations with finite elements are done for lab beams. If you have tested the beam, of course, you can simulate the behavior. But now we are doing a, a contest. I will do four panel tests in his beautiful machine. But you have to tell before what will be the result with your computer program. And then it was clear that the, the scatter was enormous. Very, very large. And the winner was Professor Vladimir Savenka. He had the best prognosis with uh, Athena. And I asked him a few days after, um, how did you do this? And he said, what I did is I have taken all the publications of Michael Collins on his earlier test. I calibrated my program, and then I had the best results. <laughs> and my reaction was like you. I thought, this is not fair. This is not fair. Huh? And then two days after, I thought, this is very smart. <laughs> and now I think this is, the, this is a basic rule to do it like this. Uh, because otherwise, you have not your best results. And in the Netherlands, we have, for instance, done uh, tests or, or calculations on, um, on beams. We had many beams, large pre-stress beams, uh, with I-shaped and, 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 and T-shaped beams. And we have collected from everywhere reports of this type of beams. And then it was calibrated this, this for uh, the, the, the program, especially for this type of beams. And then we were sure that we have a good and relatively accurate prediction. And we, we were happy to use it for the determination of many bridges, which we could save from strengthening. OK, that was my last one. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you.